Thank you to everyone. Um, so my name is Lori Cohen. I'm the Director of Adult Jewish Learning at Gratz College, and I'm really glad to see that everyone has joined us today. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate that so much to see you here. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. We, are, we hope you're all safe and well um, and enjoying some peace with your family during this time. Tonight, we are really happy to bring you the Gratz College webinar, The Exodus Story, an Historical Analysis with Rabbi Lance Sussman. He's not only the senior rabbi at Reform Congregation Knesset of Israel, he's also the chairman of the Gratz College Board of Governors. This program is the first in a series of online programs that we like to call Gratz at Home. In fact, please save the date for our next webinar, which is on Wednesday, April 22nd. The great news is that we have about 300 people who have registered for tonight. Um, not all of you are on yet, so I'm hoping that in the next 10 minutes or more that uh, a lot more people are going to sign on. Um, and then we will close this meeting at around 7.40 or 7.45, just um, so we won't let anyone uh, interrupt the meeting from, from, uh, from that point on. So again, if everyone could please turn their, uh, their audio off I understand that some people are, that we hear some background noises. So if you could just please do that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you, with although your video and audio will be off, um, you will be able to see and hear us. Okay, so I'm gonna continue on. Um, we will have an opportunity for questions, but they will wait until the end, uh, just due to the large size of uh, folks joining us tonight. I will moderate the Q&A with Rabbi Sussman at the end of the presentation. So I apologize in advance if I'm unable to get to all of your questions. So how are we gonna ask questions tonight if we can't hear you? Well, please type it inside the chat function. The chat function can be found in different locations of your screen, depending on the type of media you are using. On desktop computers or laptops, it can be found at the bottom of your screen. On tablets, it's often at the top of the screen. On cell phones, you may have to swipe left or right. So right now we are recording the session. I will send you a link to the recording after it has been processed and edited. Um, also at the end, you will receive a short online survey soon after the presentation ends. We appreciate your input as it really helps us improve your experience for future webinars. Um, now I would like to introduce and invite the president of Gratz College, Dr. Paul Finkelman to say a few words. Paul? Paul, are you out there with us? This is just like on real TV when something goes wrong, right? Um, let's see, I think you might be muted and that's why I can't hear you. So I'm gonna take care of that right now. So I do apologize for the difficulty and we'll take care of it. You hear me now. Yay, we can hear you now. Very sorry about that, Dr. Finkelman. That's okay. You know, uh, I sometimes think that my staff has been trying to figure out how to mute me for, for years, and uh, Lori figured out how to do it. Uh, everybody, it is a delight to have you here at Gratz tonight. We are all living in unusual circumstances, trying circumstances, difficult circumstances. I hope all of you are at home and healthy and taking care of yourselves. And um, as my mother of blessed memory told me almost every day of my childhood, don't forget to wash your hands. And that's important for all of us. Uh, I wanna thank Lori for all of her wonderful work in uh, putting this together. Uh, as many of you know, Gratz College has been a leader in online teaching and learning for 20 years. Uh, we have programs that reach throughout the world. We have students in 34 states. We have students in, North, in the United States, Canada. We run a class in Alaska. We have classes and students in Europe. We have students in Asia, both on the Israeli side and also on the uh, 
uh, East Asian side. Uh, we have Jewish students in Turkey taking classes with us. Uh, and we can do this because we are online so that our master's students, our doctoral students, our undergraduate students, our certificate students, our teen students have all been able to continue studying throughout the coronavirus crisis. Indeed, I suspect of any college in the country, Gratz has done the best at getting our education out because we didn't have to do anything new. We were already doing it except when it came to adult education. And so now we are moving to adult education just as we have been in all of our other programs. Um, as you know, Gratz is the oldest independent Jewish college in the United States. Uh, we celebrate our 125th anniversary this year. And I think now more than ever, as a school that is online, as, it is, as a school that confronts anti-Semitism, as, as a school that deals with the need for Jews and non-Jews to come together in a time of crisis, Gratz is essential to Philadelphia, to the Jewish community, and to the world. Um, when this program is over, Lori will let you know how you can make a donation to Gratz. Um, this is, of course, a free program, and we are delighted that you are all here. But as all of you know, Gratz survives with the generosity of its friends and the importance of our friends and our Gratz community helping us, particularly in this very stressful time. It's now my honor to introduce someone who is my rabbi, who was my colleague at one point in our careers when we taught together, the man who performed the marriage ceremony for me and my wife, uh, my board chair, and a very close friend. He is also a collaborator with me. We have published articles together. We are working on a book together. Um, Lance Sussman is, of course, a key figure in the Philadelphia Jewish community as the rabbi at KI. What some of you may not know is that he's also a very distinguished historian, a scholar of American Jewish history, and a scholar of Jewish culture and society. And so without going into any more details, I happily introduce Rabbi Dr. Lance Sussman. So I think my voice is available. I'm hoping to start the video. Just gonna, I'm sorry, still dealing with a few technical things. Um, Rabbi Sussman, we can hear you fine now. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody and uh, Welcome, I think some others are gonna be joining us uh, as we go. Uh, as you heard, uh, we're gonna to go to about 7.45 or so, uh, and then um, take a break so that there are time, there is time for uh, questions and answers. Uh, also about information about uh, future Gratz at Home programs. Again, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. I, Look forward to uh, sharing this presentation with you. Um, the topic was chosen because we are right in the middle of the holiday of Passover, and I thought it would be uh, fun and interesting to take a look uh, at the Exodus story from uh, a historical perspective. I chose the title um, very purposely because first and foremost, um, it is a story uh, 
uh, and it was written, compiled, edited uh, as a form of sacred literature. Uh, sacred literature is not the same thing as uh, history. Uh, it is not a form of uh, journalism. It's not even necessarily an eyewitness account, uh, but it serves uh, all types of, of uh, purposes. Uh, historians, archeologists, linguists and others can mine the text for historical uh, information. They'll also discover uh, folkloristic elements in it uh, and other uh, aspects. But primarily, um, primarily it is uh, sacred literature and uh, it should be appreciated first and foremost uh, from that perspective. Now, depending on your uh, relationship to uh, the story of the Passover, particularly the Exodus, uh, from a religious point of view, um, there are different things that we could, could talk about. Uh, if one happens to be uh, a believer uh, in the uh, inerrancy of the, of the Bible, that uh, one believes that uh, the Torah and other scripture uh, is given directly uh, by God, then of course every word is true. And uh, certainly in our own tradition, uh, truth does not mean it has just one meaning, but uh, as it's said among the, the rabbis, uh, each letter can bear 70 uh, different interpretations uh, at least. So uh, if, if you are uh, a believer, uh, then the story is uh, as told. Uh, there are also people who are simply traditionalists and uh, accept the story uh, of the exodus of uh, Moses being uh, born and placed in a basket and growing up and then leading the people uh, out and they accept it as a matter of uh, tradition, not really questioning whether or not it is uh, history or folklore or uh, anything else. Uh, these are unimpeachable arguments and they are to be um, respected. It also needs to be um, pointed out that uh, there was an older form of uh, ancient Israelite archeology. span I know from my younger days, somebody like a Yigal Yadin uh, believed that uh, in order to understand uh, ancient Israel, you simply needed to take your, your Jewish Bible, your Hebrew Bible, your Tanakh in your hand and walk the land and uh, the earth will eventually reveal uh, itself and confirm the biblical uh, story. Uh, today we live at very, in a very different time. You have uh, archaeologists like the Israeli archaeologist um, Israel Finkelstein, whose book, uh, Digging up the Bible pretty much starts uh, with the words that if you want to understand uh, ancient Israel, the first thing you have to do is leave your Bible at home and instead let uh, archaeology, material culture, contextual studies um, do the talking uh, and understand the biblical text as uh, a narrative uh, that comes from a certain time and a certain place, but is not necessarily of purely historical value, of great value from many directions, but not uh, historical. So tonight, what we're going to do is um, explore the Exodus story um, historically to try to determine what elements of it uh, may be empirical and what elements may have developed as a function of tradition for uh, many different purposes, theological, political, folkloristic, and, uh, and others. So if we could move on uh, to the third slide that has to do with conventional dating uh, and the story itself. Um, we're not really going to go into this um, so much because uh, I'm going to try and demonstrate that much of the story uh, is not historical, although I think in part it is informed by history, um, but we need to be familiar with the story in a synoptic form because within uh, 
the biblical report, um, there are varieties of views of the uh, of the exodus, the number of plagues, etc., uh, that don't quite um, reconcile. But there is a rather conventional view, widely held uh, view of uh, of the exodus, and uh, it it dates this story um, to the time of the Ramsiad. Um, pharaohs in Egypt, that it would place um, the exodus in the middle of the 13th century um, BCE, and 40 years in the desert would take it from about 1250 to 1210. Uh, also, in terms of the conventional understanding uh, of, uh, of the exodus, kind of a, a uncritical uh, treatment of it, it mostly follows the um, biblical report uh, that they crossed the sea, uh, and instead of taking a northern route, which would have been uh, much shorter, uh, they headed south deep into the Sinai Peninsula, into the wilderness, uh, into the mountains to uh, avoid the fortifications on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, that um, the exodus itself was in motion for about two years and then came to rest uh, at an oasis called Kadesh Barnea, which is uh, site number 12 in the map in front of you. Uh, and they sat there for about 38 years uh, before crossing into the Transjordan, what today would be the Kingdom of Jordan, and then entering the land from the east to the west at um, Jericho. Uh, I always like to say I've led many, many trips from my um, synagogue and different synagogues that um, I've, uh, I've, I've led, uh, whether they're bus trips or international trips, particularly trips to, um, to Israel. Uh, it would be pretty hard to imagine uh, a large group of Jews traveling together for 40 years. So it makes good sense to me that they got to Kadesh Barnea and sat there for 38 years. It seems to ring true to me. There are also, it's also important archeology span uh, that comes from the site of Kadesh uh, Barnea. So this would be the route uh, as depicted um, uh, in the Bible itself. Um, I remember years ago in uh, the Biblical Archeology span Society journal, uh, they had found a caravan, caravan route uh, from Egyptian sources, sources which was very close uh, to how uh, the Bible describes uh, the route of the Israelites, and it was offered as a kind of proof of the story. Um, and that is indeed at face value a very convincing argument. However, as we're going to see, um, the Israelites had uh, knowledge of Egypt, and it's not necessarily true that they had would have had to have walked this caravan route in order to reconstruct it in a literary uh, fashion. So what happened before uh, the exodus, if we could move on to slide number four, uh, we need to get um, the Jews into uh, Egypt in order to get them uh, out of it, um, just as there was an exodus or there's an argument for an exodus, there was also an eisegist, and that is a, an ingathering of uh, Jews into, uh, uh, into Egypt. Uh, in the Bible, of course, we know that through uh, the last set of stories, the largest set of stories in the book of uh, Genesis, which have to do, of course, with Joseph, uh, who was um, sent uh, to Egypt by his brothers, not on his terms, but their terms. And he rises high in the uh, uh, in the Egyptian uh, hierarchy, and then sends for uh, the rest of the um, the, the Hebrews. Um, it is true uh, that um, there was was an extensive time in ancient Egyptian Hebrew uh, that there was a semi nomadic class of um, nomad semi semi nomadic. Uh, called the Habiru or the Hapiru or the Apiru. And uh, it is possible that they form the, the background to the uh, Joseph um, story. Uh, 
uh, although there's no direct proof that the Habiru are the same as the Hebrew. Uh, the two words look, al look alike uh, in English, but in fact, Hebrew is Ivri and not Habiru or Apiru, so they're not really uh, the same. But it does give a kind of uh, general ethnological background as how it's possible that uh, Hebrew uh, pastoralists might have found their way down into uh, Egypt. Uh, equally important, perhaps even more important, of course, uh, is the fact that um, Egypt uh, was uh, settled by a group of Central Asians by the name of the Hyksos, and uh, they dominated uh, Egypt for uh, quite a while. Uh, and in fact, in fact, there were uh, Hyksos uh, pharaohs, and that too blends with the uh, Joseph story, uh, with the idea of a, a non-Egyptian uh, being raised to a high rank to govern over the Egyptians. The Egyptians, uh, of course, did not like foreigners governing them, uh, and that would have bred uh, xenophobic um, dislike and ultimately enslavement. In fact, what happened uh, were, was that the Hyksos uh, were uh, driven out uh, from Egypt by the Egyptians, uh, and that process was complete by the 16th uh, century. Uh, in fact, there was a, uh, a battle near what is today uh, Gaza of the Egyptians laying siege to um, the, the, the Hyksos uh, and vanquishing them there uh, in, in, the, in the 16th century, around the 1540 uh, BCE. That is an important um, story because it could help uh, inform uh, a theory of uh, a multiple exodus that, that people left uh, Egypt at different times arriving in the land of Israel and joining the Hebrew tribes that are there. Uh, it also uh, confirms the fact uh, that Egypt was in Israel. Uh, the story as reported uh, in the Hebrew Bible is that Israel went to Egypt. Uh, and that is something that historians of the ancient Near East uh, and biblical scholars, critical biblical scholars, uh, debate to um, this day. Uh, but on the other hand, there is no question that the Egyptians were in what we would call Israel or before Israel, uh, Canaan, and that uh, they were there um, they had a military presence there, they had a cultural and social presence there, uh, and it would not be surprising that uh, Israelites would know something about Egypt because the Egyptians, in fact, were in, uh, in, in Israel. So let's move to the uh, fifth slide, uh, and that has to do with uh, what are some of the uh, elements that uh, challenge the Exodus story as it is broadly understood, as it is reported in uh, the book of Exodus uh, through the rest of the Torah and then in some other literature in the um, Hebrew Bible. One of the um, issues uh, is uh, that there are different possible dates uh, for the Exodus. Uh, we hear in the book of Kings that uh, the Exodus took place uh, almost five centuries before King Solomon, who ruled in the early 900s, uh, which would have put the Exodus not at the time of the Ramsey, uh, Ramsey uh, pharaohs, but rather at a much uh, earlier time. Uh, and so that needs to be uh, reconciled. So it looks like they had them in the in the, in the 13th century. The story as reported uses names like um, Ramses, which was a period of tremendous uh, building and revival in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, in ancient Egypt. Uh, and a theory developed that in fact, there may have been two Exodus, an earlier one, uh, perhaps involving the, the Hyksos and a later one involving at least one of the tribes and that somehow, the two stories merge. We'll talk about uh, the development of national narratives in a moment. Uh, perhaps the most important factor um, 
in trying to assess the exodus from a historical point of view uh, is the general lack or almost total lack of uh, evidence from the uh, Egyptian side of the story. One would think that if uh, a large number of slaves would have uh, left, rebelled, it, some, it would show up somewhere uh, in Egyptian literature. There is a counter argument to that, that uh, the pharaohs didn't like what they would have called the fake news, and so they wouldn't have reported any of their, uh, uh, any of their losses, so they might not have reported it. But in fact, uh, we don't have an Egyptian account of anything akin to um, the Exodus. What we do have uh, would fall under the category of both good news and bad news. Um, in fact, the first external mention of a group of people called Israel uh, comes from the end of the 13th century, perhaps around 1210, uh, BCE from the uh, Pharaoh Mernapata, uh, who is involved in fighting uh, the Israelites uh, at a site near uh, what is Gaza uh, today. And what uh, Mernapata's uh, inscription tells us is that the Egyptians were in Canaan vanquishing the Israelites. That's good news and bad news. It's good news because it establishes from an outside source that there is a group of people called Israel as early as the year 1210 uh, BCE. The bad news is, of course, is that the Egyptians are on the east side of the sea, so that uh, given the story of the Exodus, if Moses had led them uh, across the sea, uh, to escape the Egyptians. In fact, what uh, he would have found is that there would have been uh, Egyptian armies on the other side. Maybe that's why they didn't take the northern route. Um, something modern you could compare that to in terms of story uh, telling uh, is the sound of music, uh, which is lovely, but it's not very good uh, historically because at the end, as you know, uh, the Van Trapp family uh, escapes. They're at a musical concert, giving a concert in Salzburg, Austria. Uh, they leave in the middle of the night, they go over the Alps, and they are free. The problem with that story is, had the Von Trapp family followed that story, they would have ended up in Germany. So uh, just as in our case, if they uh, uh, would have left Egypt during the Ramsiad period and crossed the sea, they would have found Egyptians uh, on the other side. Another problem from uh, a biblical uh, point of view is that um, if you uh, begin to stratify uh, Israelite literature, ancient Hebrew uh, literature, and you, you date it uh, by authorship, it becomes apparent that the Exodus story doesn't show up until relatively late in the game. Um, students of the, of the text have ways of determining the age of a, of a given text. The Song of Deborah, uh, for example, in Judges 5 is considered one of the oldest texts. It's hard for most of us who are not uh, native Hebrew speakers or Hebrew scholars to um, detect these linguistic cues. But in English, for most of us, it is, um, it is pretty easy. So if I were to put in front of you a passage from Chaucer or Shakespeare or Dickens or E.E. E. Cummings, uh, you could tell right away uh, that it's all English but it's not from the same time and it's not from the same place. Uh, there are pieces of evidence, uh, the use of loan words, et cetera, in the Hebrew text that tells us that some biblical documents are uh, older than others. And finally, in the area of simply uh, problematizing um, the text itself, uh, is that there are elements of this story uh, which are not totally unique to uh, ancient uh, Israel. For example, uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, the first great empire uh, 
builder was uh, an emperor by the name of Sargon. And, and lo and behold, in his uh, birth story, he is placed uh, in a basket in the river and floated away from his family. In other words, there is this uh, motif that we have of the little baby Moses uh, that uh, is part of ancient Israelite culture. It doesn't disprove anything, but it says that it is part of a common cultural thread, um, a, co a common cultural thread uh, that could be found among other uh, people as, uh, as well. Now, um, I see in the chat room, it says it would be helpful if I could make the current slide the full screen, just trying to re uh, react to that. But I, I don't believe I have that uh, capacity the way this is uh, being run. So I hope you can see uh, enough of it. Uh, and having a side screen should let you see a little bit of where uh, we may be, uh, may be heading. Um, now for uh, the sixth slide, what I want to do is kind of drill into the story of the Exodus itself, and again, try to, to show how this uh, could be problematic in terms of being uh, a journalistic uh, account. From the point of view of the text, um, the story of the Passover has a very specific set of purposes. Um, the main purpose uh, is for the God of Israel to prove himself uh, to be the God that the Israelites should, uh, should follow. Uh, and it's pretty clear in studying uh, the text of the Bible that uh, the kind of monotheism which exists late in the uh, late in the biblical period did not necessarily uh, exist early in the uh, biblical uh, period, that monotheism develops uh, out of uh, polytheism, to henotheism, monism, et cetera, and that eventually Yahweh becomes not just the uh, supreme God of uh, Israel, but the only God. Now, the illustration that you have in front of you uh, actually comes from Kadesh Barnea, that uh, oasis, and uh, it is a stick drawing uh, with a couple representations of the god Yahweh, uh, and if you look closely enough but don't dwell on it, it's clearly he is a male deity, and nearby is one of his female um, consorts. Uh, and this would have come from a time, let's say the 10th century, before uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, would have been viewed as the sole God of Israel, a radical monotheism. We see that in various parts of the, of the Bible, of the Torah. So, for example, uh, in the Song of the Sea, when, uh, when Yahweh defeats the sea, uh, which could also be a Canaanite god, Yam. Uh, there is a, a, a statement there in the song that we sing in our liturgy, Mi mocha ba'elim Adonai, who is like you, Yahweh, Jehovah, among the gods. In other words, there's still a recognition of different gods. Even in the um, Ten Commandments, even in the Ten Commandments, there is a statement that I am uh, uh, a jealous God among, uh, among the gods. Uh, so there is a time in which Israel is not fully monotheistic, whereas I think a big part of the story of the Passover is to wed Israel to uh, Jehovah, to Yahweh, uh, as their supreme God and perhaps as the, um, the only God. Um, in the Torah itself, in the Exodus, it is interesting that Moses uh, learns about uh, Yahweh from uh, his father-in-law, from Yitro. It seems that uh, uh, this God that becomes the God of Israel may have had uh, foreign roots. There are a couple hints that uh, Yahweh may have come into Israelite culture from outside 
of Israelite culture. So uh, first is uh, we have the Midianites. There was also a Shasu uh, people who were mentioned uh, not in the Bible necessarily, but in ancient as in ancient Near Eastern literature, uh, who were attached to um, the uh, uh, the god Yahweh. Uh, in the small prophetic book of Habakkuk, uh, there is a line that says that Yahweh comes out of Seir, that would be southern Jordan toward northern Saudi Arabia. And in Judges 5, which is the song of, of Deborah, there's also a reference there that maybe some of the Israelites themselves uh, came from that, uh, from that territory. Uh, this leads us to, um, this leads us to um, the possibility uh, that the, the Hebrews or the Israelites themselves were not a monolithic people, but in fact that they were uh, they were uh, all types of different people who become amalgamated. With respect to a radicalized, uh, a radicalized uh, monotheism, we don't see that until Isaiah 44, uh, who declares that I am the first, I am the last, and I am the only. And later editors of the Torah will then take that radicalized uh, monotheism and superimpose it uh, upon uh, the rest of the uh, story as part of the um, editing process. Uh, I did see one question that came up about Hyksos and Habiru. No, they are not um, the same people. They are both foreigners to Egypt. They go to Egypt uh, and have very different functions in, in Egypt. More questions, of course, will follow. So let's go to slide number seven, where we, again, we take a look at the uh, the text of the uh, Torah itself. Uh, one of the questions uh, that um, historians and others have been um, asking of the biblical text was uh, who wrote it and, and when. Um, this is not a new question. Uh, it's already obvious to the rabbis uh, and the Talmud uh, that the Torah ends uh, with a report of the death of Moses. So either Moses and his prophetic function um, was able to report on his own death or somebody else like his successor. Joshua actually writes the end of the book of, uh, of Deuteronomy, which would mean you would have at least two sources. And we also know from other parts of the Hebrew Bible that there were other books available, such as uh, the Book of the Wars of the Lord, that biblical editors drew upon in uh, its own day. Uh, but perhaps the, the key verse um, which scholars uh, have seized on since the Middle Ages that have raised questions as to when was the Torah actually written uh, comes from Genesis 12, 6, where it says uh, that the Canaanite then Oz was in the land. Uh, and the understand, simple understanding of that would be that whoever wrote that was living at a time when there was no longer a group of people uh, who self-identified as Canaanite living in the land. This was already noticed in the Middle Ages by one of the great rabbinic uh, scholars, Avraham Ibn uh, Ezra, whose comment was pretty much, let's not, uh, let's not discuss this verse because it raises questions about, uh, so it raises questions about um, the point of view, the world view of the uh, um, editor of the uh, Torah. A couple years ago at one of my um, rabbinic conferences, uh, I went to hear uh, a professor uh, David uh, Sperling from uh, HUCJIR New York give a talk on the dating of the Torah, and he commented on a recent Torah portion from Leviticus 6, Mtsav, uh, that talked about the Mechnesayim of the priests. Well, in at least modern Hebrew, um, the term Mechnesayim means pants, and there is a question as to what does the Torah mean when it talks about uh, the pants of the um, 
of the uh, ancient priests of Israel, because according to his research, the idea of trousers that men would wear uh, don't occur as a form of, of clothing until the Persian period, until let's say the uh, 500s, which would make it an anachronism. Uh, when the great movie Ben-Hur was uh, shot with that giant chariot scene of Apparently, Carlton Heston forgot to take his Timex watch off. It cost a million dollars to make the scene, and they couldn't afford to uh, reshoot it. Uh, there was an anachronism in it, but they were able to Photoshop it out. And the question he asks is this uh, an anachronism, a, a Persian loan term, which maybe uh, signifies a late editorship of the uh, Torah. Uh, itself, which means it would not be contemporaneous with the events of the Exodus, but rather uh, a distant recreation from um, centuries later. Uh, this same point of view was seized upon by uh, Baruch um, Spinoza, who mostly understood uh, biblical literature in a uh, political fashion as opposed to um, religious, uh, seeing it as a a justification for uh, Israelite um, monarchy. So since the Middle Ages into the early modern uh, period, uh, there have been questions raised about when was the Torah actually written and how far was it in time, how distant in time from the events that it actually is um, describing. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, throughout the 19th century, but particularly towards the end, uh, there was the crystallization of what uh, became known as the documentary hypothesis, uh, which is still there. It's uh, under great attack today. It's always been under attack. And basically, it argued that there were four different strands uh, that made up the Torah, four different literary schools, a J, E, D, and P strand that J and E are the two of the olders, J being a southern um, tradition, E being a northern tradition from the two kingdoms, D being uh, from Deuter the Deuteronomic uh, school, uh, which would be uh, beginning with King Hosea in the late seventh century and going all the way through um, second kings. It ha has its own uh, theology and way of reporting Israelite history. And then the most um, debated of the strands, the peace strand or priestly, uh, which uh, at least in the time of uh, Wellhausen, the great German documentary um, uh, theoretician was considered to be the last strand uh, and ultimately the uh, redactors of the, uh, the redactors of the Torah, which would have been in the 400s, putting it 800 years uh, away from the story of the um, Exodus itself. Today, under the influence of modern archaeology and anthropology in particular, uh, the idea that a priestly worldview is not necessarily less ancient than others. In fact, uh, pre-contact people can have very, very complex mythologies and, uh, and ritual uh, systems. But the documentary hypothesis in general would suggest that uh, what the Exodus story is not, is not a journalistic account. Uh, some modern scholars, for example, Gary Rensberg, my, my friend up at Rutgers, uh, does not view the Torah necessarily as uh, mosaic, uh, but rather of Solomonic origin. Uh, his, ar his argument would be that in the ancient world, only the priests, only the kings, etc., would have had the capacity to employ uh, the capacity to uh, employ uh, scribes and writers and uh, um, uh, scribes and, and 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 scholars who could put together such uh, an ex an extensive uh, text. Uh, I see one of the questions is why does Canaanite then in the land uh, be, why is that a problem? And the observation of Ibn Ezra uh, it is, and then Spinoza and then others after them has to do with the word then, uh, meaning uh, they lived there then, but not now. That is the narrator of the story uh, uh, no longer 
uh, was living in a time when Canaanites were in the land. That doesn't mean it doesn't bear a different interpretation where, let's say, in a storytelling way, you could simply say that was the time when the Canaanites were then in the land and it was all uh, present tense. But the point is to, uh, in this particular analysis, to uh, problematize the story. And this is a piece of evidence uh, that scholars have seized upon repeatedly uh, and trying to create distance between the report uh, of the Exodus and the Exodus itself. And we're all familiar uh, with a dynamic of something like uh, whisper down the lane that when a story is told and retold, uh, its details begin to, to change, even if it's in a small circle of kids or fish stories among old men, et cetera, uh, et cetera. So it's, it's simply, I'm pointing it out as one of those verses that critical scholars have seized upon. So we move to number eight, which has to do with conquest versus um, settlement. Uh, and this is uh, important uh, for the following uh, reason. It allows for, uh, among other things, a, a dual uh, exodus um, theory uh, that the name Israel arises uh, in the time of the monarchy and that, in fact, uh, the name Israel brings together um, disparate tribes who were not linked together. The way the biblical story is uh, organized is that there was an Abraham back in the city of Ur and Haran, and that he had a big family, and that uh, eventually uh, his great-grandchildren um, developed different tribes and that they were all of one uh, lineage. Uh, there are other views that aren't reported this way uh, in the Bible itself, which would suggest uh, that the name Israel is a federated name, not unlike other national um, identities. Uh, so if we take, for example, uh, the UK uh, as an example, it takes quite a while and the amalgamation of uh, Anglo, Saxon, and Norman before you get uh, the identity of English, let alone British, which is an 18th century that will include the Scots and the Irish and the Welsh, uh, groups of people who have over history a pretty hard time living together, although today you're united under a single uh, flag under the Union Jack, which really doesn't appear until the uh, 18th century. Uh, the same certainly was true of different uh, German tribes, how Persia and Iran came together, uh, and many countries actually have uh, these uh, disparate beginnings uh, where there's many different groups of people and eventually uh, a federated uh, centralized identity uh, emerges. The question is among all those groups, whose narrative is going to be uh, primary. So for example, uh, here in the United States, uh, we have indigenous people, then we have European contact. And we know, for example, that the Spanish were uh, building walled cities of stone in the 16th century, long before the first English ax brought down a tree in, uh, in um, New England. Uh, and yet when we tell, quote, the American saga, we tend to emphasize the Anglo-Saxon thread in it, although there is very much a Spanish thread which precedes it. There's also an extensive French story where the French are working in Canada all the way down to the Mississippi uh, in telling the American story, and this is reinforced by the development of holidays like uh, Thanksgiving, the Anglo-Saxon part of it uh, prevails. Otherwise, Mardi Gras might be uh, one of our great holidays instead of localized to New Orleans instead of Thanksgiving, which has become uh, the national holiday, which in part establishes the primacy of the, uh, the Anglo part of the American uh, narrative. Uh, given this picture, if we were to look at ancient Israel uh, and we think about the tribes as the spirit, perhaps, for example, the tribe of Dan 
which originally is reported as to being near the Gaza border, was actually of Philistine origin, mixed married heavily with the uh, Judeans and Simeonites and others in the south, became distant from Dan, relocates to um, the north, and then amalgamates with, uh, amalgamates with uh, the rest of the kingdom of Israel or with uh, the Hebrews becoming Israel. Is it possible that Issachar, the tribe, is Ish Sachar, uh, a man of the god Sachar, a Canaanite deity of business? And they too, quote, assimilate or acculturate into Israel. But the most important of these uh, would be the Levites, uh, who, according to one theory, which was already popular in the 1930s, were uh, the last group to come out of uh, uh, of Egypt, or maybe they were the primary group, they were relatively small, that these different uh, Hebrew tribes were already in the land of uh, Canaan, they were settled there, they may have been indigenous there, uh, they may have joined them from other sources in Canaan, and then the Levites join them, and the Levite story becomes the primary national narrative. So you might have had an early uh, an early uh, exodus coming from a group uh, like uh, the Hyksos, and then a later one, which becomes dominant, the Levites. And part of the proof of that is even a name like Moses, uh, Moshe, is of Egyptian origin. It's not unlike the name uh, Ramses. In fact, his Hebrew name is not given by the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew text at all. Uh, he's later known to the rabbis as uh, Ish Tov, which becomes Tuvia, which becomes uh, Tevya. But Moshe himself is, uh, the name is of Egyptian origin, the same way that Esther is not a Hebrew name. Uh, her Hebrew name would have been Hadassah. We know that the names of the months, with the exception of Aviv, are also Mesopotamian in origin. So uh, it is possible that instead of ha having the biblical report of a conquest and then a settlement, that in fact there was a settlement, uh, there would have been settlement first, and then the Levite narrative ultimately comes to, uh, to uh, rule the day. Uh, and that by about the seventh century, somewhere in the 600s uh, BCE, uh, Yahweh, Jehovah, Hashem has become um, the radicalized monotheistic God of ancient Israel and the Moses Exodus story becomes their ideological tale of uh, national origin. So if we could quickly go to slide nine, so I want to watch the clock uh, at uh, this point. Um, the biblical story uh, also has a couple clues. Uh, Moses argues with the Pharaoh to let the people go out in the desert to celebrate. Some scholars have asked the question, was there a pre-Passover Exodus holiday? Was the celebration of Pesach and Matzah always uh, connected to one another? Certainly in the rabbinic uh, period, the primary celebration of Passover was done through sacrifices in the temple, although there is that important verse uh, in Exodus, who you will narrate or tell your child on that day, which becomes the basis of the rabbinic um, Passover. In terms of the rabbinic Passover, um, it develops after, of course, the destruction, primarily the destruction of the temple in the year um, 70. Uh, there is a debate in the Talmud as to who compiled uh, the Haggadah, where we tell the story to each other at home during the Seder. Uh, one argument is that it was Judah the Prince in the early um, 200s, who's also the compiler of the Mishnah, and that we don't have a um, full edition of the Haggadah until the ninth century in Iraq, uh, the Gaon Sadia Sadia uh, Hagaon. Uh, the story passes from uh, Judaism to Christianity becomes part of the central motif of, of Christianity and also is accepted by Islam. Finally, uh, to review and to conclude um, so that we have time for some questions, the 10th one, 
um, that we have no corroborated um, corroborating source from outside of the Bible to prove the Exodus as historical. I think one could make the argument that where there's smoke, there's fire, there's just too much here for it all simply to have been made up. But what we know of the or origins of national narratives that it was probably complex and there may have been more than one kind of ingathering ultimately that amalgamates to form what becomes the biblical report of the, um, the Exodus. And it certainly becomes central to ancient Israel late in the time of the Judean or Southern uh, monarchy, that the Passover is transformed uh, by the rabbis. It is transformed again uh, in Christianity. Uh, and it is also true in Christianity that there's lack of historical corroboration. It's kind of the same story with different um, details. Well, what value then could it be if it's not historical? Well, as I uh, began, uh, I would say we have to understand that it's the Exodus story. It is the Exodus sacred story. It's of inherent value to itself and in um, tradition uh, that it teaches various lessons through uh, narrative. Um, it's a stretch, I would say, to compare it uh, to a fairy tale, because I don't want to say that it's a fairy tale, but it has a similar function in the idea of whether or not there was ever a little girl by the name of Cinderella. That story teaches values about uh, the worth of all children, particularly about little girls. And even more so in a, in a political sense um, that uh, we could compare the story to the English legend of the uh, of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Tables again lack of corroborative evidence that it seems to take place somewhere in the fifth century in the late Roman period although it becomes the paradigm of medieval uh, knighthood uh, and it's not reported on for several centuries after the fifth century uh, my understanding is of the phrase that the story is Mycenae from Sinai doesn't mean so much that it existed at the time of Sinai. It's not the preposition from, but rather since. That is, since the stories of Sinai, since the stories of Moshe, of Moses, this story of the Passover uh, has emerged as central to the narrative of ancient Israel, and that the Jewish tradition and then later to other traditions uh, continue to adopt and adapt it, and that it's ever merging the idea of, an, of a living religious uh, tradition, which is the essence of what uh, sacred storytelling is all about. So I hope that uh, uh, is uh, an introduction for you into terms, in terms of some historical analysis of the Passover, uh, and also why the Passover, whatever its origins, remains of, uh, of ultimate significance in the Jewish experience to this day. I'd like to hand it back to Laurie for a minute now, and then she's also going to be looking at the chat room uh, and asking a couple of questions of me from all of you who've been listening in, and I, I thank you for joining me uh, this evening of Passover. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm back. And uh, I really want to thank you, Rabbi Sussman, for a very interesting and uh, even controversial look at the Exodus story. Uh, before opening up for questions, I'd like to remind everyone about next week's webinar on Wednesday, April 22nd. Our Gratz College adjunct Hebrew instructor, uh, Rhonda Whitland, brings her brand of energetic teaching to a taste of conversational Hebrew. Uh, this beginner's introductory conversational Hebrew lesson will review and refresh your ability to hold a basic conversation in Hebrew. Uh, so you can greet your friends and neighbors, uh, beginning and seasoned Hebrew speakers are encouraged to attend. So that's the conversational Hebrew. <clears throat> so please save a few dates on your calendar uh, for our next Gratz at Home webinars. We've got um, with Herb Kaufman, he's a military historian. That's Tuesday, April 28th. 
On Tuesday, May 5th, we have a webinar with Dr. Ruth Sandberg, and I know many of you love her, so please be sure to sign up for that one. <clears throat> and as a, just one thing to let you know is that we have rescheduled our gala, which is normally May, was supposed to be May 31st. We have rescheduled it to Sunday, December 6th. So, and to all of you alumni out there, please don't forget to update your contact information on our website and to join the Gratz Facebook alumni page as well. Um, so we launched the Gratz at Home series as a way of showing that we are here for our community in this challenging time. <clears throat> and we're thrilled to have received such a strong response. As I mentioned earlier, nearly 300 people registered for tonight's webinar. <clears throat> Among those participating tonight are alumni and current students, both local to Philadelphia and even from around the world. As Dr. Finkelman shared in his introduction, Gratz College has been a leader in online learning for nearly 20 years. With the COVID crisis moving the world quickly into the virtual realm, Gratz College's online community and degree programs are now even more essential and more relevant than ever. If you would like to help strengthen Gratz and make it possible for even more students across the world to participate in our online programs, I invite you to make a de tax deductible charitable donation today. A gift of any size will make a difference. Once you complete the survey, you will receive a link to our online giving page. Thank you for participating tonight and thank you for your support. And let's get on to some more questions now, shall we? So I'd like to open this back up to Rabbi Sussman and to your questions for him. So <clears throat> um, I do have a few questions here that have been part of the chat. And Rabbi Sussman, you might see them. Yes. Find us great. Um, do you want to take those yourself or should I read them to you? So I can, I can do it. Thanks, Laurie. And thanks okay, great. For the technical support. Um, I'm better at talking than doing all the computer work, so I really appreciate you being part of it this evening. Um, there's a question about when did the Habiros enter and leave Egypt? Um, the Habiru were a broad class of people, not just in Egypt, but you would have found them over by the Tigris and Euphrates as well, all across the um, ancient Near East, and they are, are there for centuries. Uh, we should remember that there is a swirl of people that, you know, we talk a lot about migration today, but in fact, uh, immigration and migration is really um, um, uh, part of the human experience, that it is normative for people to migrate, um, that um, they were just a group of people moving around. The question that historians asked is, um, uh, were the Hebrews direct, um, were, the, were the Hebrews direct descendants of the Habiru? And nobody's ever found the smoking gun evidence of that. So the Habiru are present through much of the ancient, going back past the 21st um, century. Um, the next two questions that I have were why then in the land is a problem, and I think we addressed that already. It can be read as non-problematic. Uh, the point is that scholars have seized in particular on that verse, and that's my only point there. Uh, one of the great things about uh, biblical scholarship and then rabbinic explication, parshanut, is that it can yield so many different uh, readings uh, for the Doubting Thomases that, that this is a powerful statement of late editor uh, editing and for others it says a big deal it's just part of uh, the narration. Why does why did the rabbis tell the story because it tells us to it says you will tell this to your kids and they seize on that verse we don't know what was done uh, in the uh, earlier period we don't have a, a report uh, I know in the Christian world, there's a great interest today uh, in the Seder as to whether or not it was the Last Supper. And, it, it, and it, there are problems with that, at least in the, in the sense that the passage, the earliest passages that we have are considerably later uh, than what would have been the conventional dating, um, the conventional dating for the Exodus. So if it was a Passover, Seder would not have looked like the Seder that uh, we would know today or even could reconstruct from the earliest rabbinic, rabbinic stratum of the, um, of the, of the Tanaim. Um, 
another question that's uh, coming up on my uh, chat list here, is it possible that, um, that there was an Ephraimite raid? Uh, it's a great um, question. Ephraim and Menashe are part of the two, they're, they're subdivisions of the two larger tribes uh, that are associated principally with the kingdom of Israel. It's important to remember that uh, with the death of Solomon, uh, a unified Israelite kingdom, according to the report of the Hebrew Bible, splits into a larger, more prosperous kingdom in the north called Israel and a, a smaller, less prosperous in the south, that there seems to be more affinity in the northern kingdom uh, with the Joseph stories. And that would, uh, and the, the grave of Joseph, of course, is in the northern part of what we would call the West Bank in, in Nablus. So it would be one of many possibilities of informing the, the creation of, an, is, of, a, of a Passover story that ultimately, like the nation itself, is, uh, is unified. Um, so the next question is, if you give me one second just to read it. Um, um, I'll read it. It's a, it's a sophisticated statement. Uh, my acknowledgement that fundamentalism based on literal interpretation, the fact is it really necessary. Perhaps we can say that the ongoing created myth of Passover can be more powerful than the literal interpretation. Well, that's the point that I tried to make uh, at the end. I'm, I myself am not a fundamentalist, obviously, or a literalist. I do believe in the concept of me Sinai, since Sinai, but I did want to uh, purposely show respect uh, for anybody who was listening in or anybody who hears about this, that uh, I have an appreciation for those who accept the Torah uh, as a historical statement. I, I don't accept that myself, but quote, I know where that's coming from. And my point is not to um, disrespect anybody of that opinion, but merely to show how scholars have unpacked this story from uh, a different way, uh, in a different way. Uh, the next question is, uh, did the use of the Tetragrammaton, yud heh vav uh, come into being during the time of the Exodus? Uh, and there, my, um, uh, my argument uh, would be, I think it's part of a larger question as to how did this God named yud heh vav -Heh become the God of Israel? Is it, indigenous, is it an indigenous God? Was it adopted from the outside? And uh, I think that that God existed early on, uh, and, but does not become central uh, or exclusive in Israel until much later. So in terms of problematizing the story, um, yod He vav He, that God would have had to have been the supreme, even exclusive God, of Israel uh, before the Passover story came into its final uh, rendition. Uh, it, Israel Finkelstein's uh, debunking of the Exodus is simply that there are no, uh, there is no evidence, there are, is no positive uh, report um, that it happened uh, in Egyptian sources and there's nothing uh, on the ground. If several million people moved across the Sinai, they would have left a lot of garbage behind. And um, archaeology often is simply exploring ancient people's garbage. Garbage sites tend not to be raided later by thieves uh, and reconstructing diet and everything else uh, comes through uh, archaeology. So he has no positive proof and therefore can't uh, affirm it, and then would also have to argue um, that the text itself, based on linguistic analysis, is of a later uh, of a later time. Any evidence at all? Uh, I'll do this as my last uh, question. I want to see if there's anything else below that that the Hebrews built the pyramids. Um, well, most of the pyramids were already built by the time of the Ramses, if you accept the um, 
argument that it's a 13th century story in the time of uh, the stock city of Ramses, uh, and that they were already uh, falling apart, although the Ramseyads did um, a great deal of rebuilding um, themselves. The bigger problem is locating a group of people called Hebrews in Egypt at all. We have Habiru, but do we have specifically Hebrew in, in uh, Egypt? Again, the Egyptian sources for that are, uh, are silent. Uh, does the, do the Dead Sea Scrolls sh show any light on this? No, they come from a much later uh, period. They're really from more than a thousand, year, thousand years later. Um, Political sociological reasons for the Exodus story. I think it was mostly theological, tell the truth, by the rabbis that uh, what they wanted to show uh, in the second century, that just as God had saved the, the Jewish people uh, in ancient days, he would come again, and it's a male deity, uh, he would come again to their rescue after the destruction of the temple, and they should never give up hope for uh, of a uh, of a restoration to the land of Israel. And I'm not sure uh, what the last one exactly means. How did it get from historical to, I'm not sure what the, the term itself means, so I have to apologize for that. Um, the story of Passover is powerful. It's a story of movement from slavery to freedom. It's a story about redemption. It's a story about hope. And I think this year, uh, was particularly significant for people all across the Jewish community. Uh, for those of us who had never thought about a plague before, I think our thinking about a plague will always be uh, informed by the experience of, uh, of uh, 2020 and a new, deep, powerful dimension of this story uh, has developed. Uh, our ancestors were asked to stay at home and practice social distancing, so were we. Uh, I very much enjoyed the um, Saturday night Seder and the explication of next year. Uh, the Seder and Passover is about hope for the future and that next year in Jerusalem is truly a statement not only of national aspiration, but also uh, of the concept of hope and redemption for Jews and for all of humanity. So I, I want to thank you all, so many of you, for uh, joining me tonight. Uh, please tune in to the other Grats at Home uh, series and join us at the college for other opportunities at adult Jewish learning. Have a good evening. Happy Passover. Thank you so much, Rabbi Sussman. Thank you. I'd like to extend a very grateful thank you to you for sharing your thoughts about the Exodus. I think everyone was interested in your presentation tonight. And also a big thanks to all of those who are still on. You've invited Gratz into your living room tonight. So thank you, we're happy to be here. We'll see you next time for a, for a little Hebrew lesson, hopefully. Take care everyone, have a very good night. Be well. <laughs>